Okay, yeah, so uh, my name is Ryan, um, and yeah, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Leeds in the UK, um, researching live coding of music, which is, uh, well, what I'll talk to you today about, um, and how you can do it using Python. Um, so, for overview of this talk, I'll go ahead and try and answer some of the questions that you might be having about live coding. And the first one is usually, what is live coding? Because a lot of people haven't heard of it. Um, and usually, People's follow-up question is, why on earth do you use that to make music? Um, so hopefully I will try to answer that as well. And at that point, again, hopefully, you will be interested enough to maybe want to know how to do it yourself. And I'll talk you through about uh, the different languages that people use to live code and how you can do it in Python before doing a bit of a, a live demo, which would hopefully um, pique your interest. And then if there's some questions you have left over at the end, I can answer them. So yeah, first question, what is live coding? So here's a quote from a website, toplap.org, which is the organization for promotion of live algorithmic performance, and it goes like this. Live coding is a new direction in electronic music and video, and it's getting somewhere interesting. Live coders expose and rewire the innards of software while it generates improvised music. OK, that sounds kind of interesting, but what does that mean? So it's using code, or writing software, to describe rules for music, like pitch and rhythm and things like that. But it can also be used to generate visuals, create choreography for dance, and maybe even other things we haven't even tried using yet. I like to think of it as a, a live notation, kind of like composing music, but as the performance itself. In contrast to your typical software development uh, experience, which we kind of call dead coding, um, you're interacting with your code while it's running. You're not saving your file and you know, maybe compiling it or deploying it and running it. Um, you have this feedback loop where you will write code, uh, evaluate it, and it'll start to generate music. And at that point, you can listen and then react and edit your code and run it again. And you kind of enter this feedback loop that continues throughout your performance. Um, so you might be thinking, oh, I want to add something here or take something out, change something. And this feedback loop kind of you know, runs for 30 minutes, and then that's kind of the end of the performance. And that, in a nutshell, is a live coding performance. So what does it look like? So here's some pictures of people live coding. There's um, someone on stage writing code, writing software that generates audio for other people. It's a bit of a weird experience, because usually when you program, you're doing it alone, or maybe like you're in an open plan office or something, but the program experience is for you, your eyes only at that point. But instead, it opens up the programming experience to a group of people. It's this very communal activity, um, which is kind of strange. And then people kind of interact with the code you're writing through dancing to music, if, if, if that's the kind of music you're making, that is. Um, and you can see in all these, these images, uh, the code is projected. And that's a very uh, important part of live coding. It's showing your screen. Because one, otherwise you're just watching someone type on the laptop for half an hour, which is kind of weird. Um, and it also shows that you know, we're not just pressing play to a pre-recorded track and checking our emails on our Facebook or something and then getting the applause at the end. But also, it kind of opens up the process, gives the audience a way into what we're doing. Hopefully, they can sort of see the changes to code then relate to changes in, in sound. So a quick um, brief history of live coding and how we've got to where we are now. Uh, the first person to create musical notes using a computer was famous computer scientist Alan Turing back in 1948. But back then, to, to create just a few minutes of sound, you'd have to run a program for hours or days on your big kind of IBM supercomputers that took up an entire room. Definitely not live. Um, but as time went on, 60s and 70s, we had more uh, powerful and smaller machines and more effective and efficient algorithms for creating music with computers. And um, by the 70s, we had the Yamaha DX7 uh, keyboard, which ha um, was basically commercially available, and people could make, essentially, computer music from their home. Um, by the 1980s, computers, uh, home computers started to come with their um, own sound synthesis chips, and we had programming languages dedicated to creating music, usually through MIDI, um, and often for creating video game music. But this is the point we started to have languages dedicated to making music. And a few years later, we had our first, well, our earliest documented performance of live coding by Ron Kuvula in Amsterdam. 
and as with many live coding performances, it ended with a system failure. Because you're not just experimenting with music, but you're experimenting with software. And as you push your software to the limits, it can often lead to a crash. And actually, that's probably the time you get the biggest cheer of the evening, because people kind of are really into it when you, when you crash your computer live on stage. It's kind of the equivalent of smashing guitar, I guess. Um, um, so in recent years, there's been a bit of a surge in popularity in live coding through something called the Algorave movement. And Algorave is an amalgamation of algorithmic and rave music. And that's, it's about getting people together to dance to music created by code. Algorave is kind of a, a stupid word, it's a bit silly, but then again, so is coming together to dance to algorithms. Um, so it kind of represents it quite well. And it's also a bit silly on purpose because it shows that we don't really take ourselves too seriously. When, people, when I say computer music to people, they think about someone in a big studio with lots of equipment and wires and headphones going, hmm, hmm, listening to strange sounds in isolation. But Algorave is about getting people together to have fun with computer music, basically. This has been happening since about the year 2001 um, in, uh, in um, countries across the world. I think we've had Algorave's in about 66 different cities across the world, um, in Europe, North America, Asia. Um, who knows when the next one in Slovakia will be. Um, people will generally improvise their music. They'll open a text editor that's got a blank screen, start typing, and create a live improvised piece of music for people to dance to. So that's kind of the what is live coding. So now I'm going to try and answer why would you want to live code? Why would you want to use code for music anyway? Well, in many ways, we already do use code for music. This is um, a typical piece of sheet music um, used in sort of chamber music. And in a way, it contains information that gets decoded by a human performer and translated into some sort of output, which is music. Uh, a composer uses you know, data types, these notes that have values like their pitch, their duration, their amplitude, um, and puts it into you know, a file and into an entity that is then decoded, like I said. But in contrast to this sort of uh, style of writing music where the sheet music does not change once it has been written, live coding is flexible. It allows us to describe and you know, create rules um, for pitch and melody and things like that. Um, but also allows us to change those rules. We're not limited by a user interface. Um, if we want to write a new function that does something cool, we can because we have all of the utility of, of a programming language at our fingertips. Um, it allows us to interact with our composition, like I said. Um, it's, it's very flexible and it allows us to operate on the cutting edge of liveness. And what do I mean when I, when I say liveness? Well, what is live when we talk about music? Um, so when I do some workshops with students, I ask them to organize different music, uh, musical examples into from the not live to live. But um, rather than doing that to save some time, I've sort of already done that for you. So on the far left, we've got someone listening to music on the radio. Um, that's definitely not live. I think we can all agree on that. Um, music has been recorded weeks, months, even years ago, but we're only hearing it now through um, the radio. Maybe a little bit more live than that is a DJ playing a track at a, an event. They are there, they've got sort of control over what order the tracks come out, and, uh, come out in, um, and can control sort of amplitude and some of the, the filters, but the music itself was recorded previously. There's a latency between when the music happened, I guess, and when it's heard. A little bit more live, we have a singer like Katy Perry singing on stage. Now she's singing live, um, but the backing track, again, has been recorded beforehand. We start to have this sort of mix of the live and not live. Um, so maybe it's not quite as live as, say, the London Philharmonic Orchestra um, playing a piece in front of an audience together. Um, and a lot of people think that's kind of the definition of live music, so people playing instruments together in front of an audience. But I've added, um, just to the right of that, um, Miles Davis, or any jazz musician really, he's a very famous jazz musician, um, as a bit more live. And the reason for that is that the music itself isn't pre-written. The orchestra is playing a piece of music that might have been written hundreds of years ago, whereas these jazz musicians often come up with things on the spot, right there, live. 
Um, and we can sort of think about music not just being the creation of sound, but also the conception of it when it was made up, when it was thought of. And that's kind of where live coding comes in, because what we're doing is we're thinking as performance. The code kind of represents our train of thought, what we're doing and the decisions we're making and how it creates music live for people. Um, with an element of risk of, of, uh, involved, things can go wrong. Like I said, you can crash your machine, you can get things wrong, doesn't sound so good. But doing it a, gr a good performance, it sort of showcases a really high level of virtuosity. You kind of know if someone's live coding well, you know they're good at it. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. The music is generated in real time, but the live applies to the thought process, the, the cognitive action um, of, of the performer. Um, there's a link there to a paper I wrote about the kind of relationship between live coding and jazz, if anyone is interested, but I haven't got a lot of time to go into that right now. So, hopefully you're kind of interested at this point. Oh, I might want to try this myself. I'm a programmer, I have some skills, in, 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 especially with Python. How can I do it? Well, here's a few examples of existing live coding languages. Um, Super Collider is a language that's kind of the granddaddy of live coding languages. Um, it comes with its own sound synthesis, synthesis engine, and it's really powerful, really fast, but it requires quite a lot of typing to get a little bit of music, um, and it's got quite a steep learning curve, so it's very punishing to newer users. Another language is Tidal Cycles, um, which is embedded in Haskell programming language, so it's a functional um, program. Um, and it allows people to kind of create functions of patterns of uh, pitches or of numbers to create pitch and rhythm and things like that. And it was actually used to create the No Man's Sky soundtrack, if any of you have played that game. So a lot of the music was created um, using tidal cycles. Um, but the functional aspect didn't really work for me. I wanted to be able to take, say if I had a melody somewhere, I wanted to take that melody and do something with it. But being a functional program, it held no state, and I wasn't able to do that. Uh, Sonic Pi, some of you might have heard of, which comes prepackaged on the Raspberry Pi machine, which is based in Ruby, um, which is used to teach school children about coding and help you know, give them an idea of how they can use code to do things, and you can make music that way. But again, it requires quite a lot of typing to get a bit of music done. I wanted to make music quickly, and like I said, be able to have some sort of state that I can used you know, like melodies and rhythms that I can reuse elsewhere in the program. So I decided to create my own live coding environment um, called Foxdot, which is based in Python. And that's got a real focus on object orientation. And like I said, um, I wanted to have accessible states that I could manipulate from other places in the program and create objects that could be reactive and dynamic in the context of music, because I think music is, is better when it is dynamic and there's lots of change. Uh, I wanted to focus on musical patterns rather than the digital signal processing. So it didn't have to be you know, a super fast language, you didn't have to do it in C or anything. Um, so Python suited it in that respect. And also I wanted to make sure it had a clean syntax. Um, easy for new programmers or new live coders to, to write, but also easy to read so the audience doesn't get sort of um, a bit obfuscated by syntax, you know, by uh, lots of semicolons and, and braces and things. It's quite um, created with the audience in mind. Um, so here's a kind of diagram of how it works. Foxdot is a Python library like any other. You can get it from PyPy. Um, but it comes with its own editor that you can live code with, uh, written in tkinter, which the user can use, or they can import Foxdot into their own application if they want to make music. Um, and it handles things like event scheduling, when musical events sh should happen, like I said, the states of these player objects, like um, what their current values are, if they're making music, um, variables that are time dependent, because when you're live coding, um, your program is, is evolving through time, you want things to change in that time, because music is all about change. Um, and it also handles pattern grammars, which I'll explain in a little bit. So Foxdot then sends messages via the open sound control protocol to Super Collider, which I mentioned before, which has the powerful sound engine, uh, engine, and it does all the signal processing and outputs the audio. So this is um, what a typical Fox Dot session looks like. This is the editor, but it looks quite a bit different to your typical Python programming session. And I'll go through some of the key elements and explain what they are. So these um, two character 
uh, variables are all created at runtime, and they are assigned to um, the player, ob to player objects, and these are used to actually generate the music. And they are given instructions. Um, the first instruction is the name of the instrument or synth definition it should play. So in this case, we're playing a pluck sound, and that pluck instrument gets called, and we put our, inst our instructions in there. So the first argument, which is a list of numbers, relates to pitch, and then we use keyword arguments to specify other parameters like duration, octave, and other things like filters, such as reverb, or things like that. We also have a special um, sample player synth definition, which instead of taking a list of notes, list of numbers that's interpreted as, as pitches, it takes a string of characters where each character is mapped to a different sound file we have stored on your local machine. Um, and that gets parsed. So as you can see, there's lots of brackets in there. And each bracket uh, does something differently. So the square brackets will play multiple samples in quick succession. Round brackets will alternate uh, which sample gets played on each loop through that sequence. And curly braces plays a sample at random to add some more variety to your, your sequence. Uh, so you have pattern objects. I mentioned patterns before. Um, so patterns it, it kind of are very um, frequent in music. Um, we don't, probably don't realize that as things repeat themselves but change slightly, these are kind of like patterns. And that's what music is all about, repetition, but with change in that repetition. Um, so these are kind of a bit like Python lists but they have sort of arithmetic operations a bit like numpy, numpy arrays. So here, if I did two lists and added them together, it would concatenate them into a longer list. Whereas if I create a pattern object, which is just by using the p prefix, um, it will add the elements in order. And then these pattern objects also come with methods that are really useful for manipulating the order. So palindrome will append the reverse of that list to the, to the end of it. Rotate will shift all the um, elements one or more over in the list, and stretch will repeat the list until, the, repeat the pattern until it gets to a certain length, things like that. And there's also certain um, functions like the pdir there, they're, they're all named, uh, start with p, that will create um, a series of numbers that are useful, so three and eight will create a rhythm with three events that will last over eight quarter beats uh, based on the Euclidean rhythm, um, it's a very interesting to read about if you are interested in this. Um, yeah. So there's also these time-dependent variables that I, that I mentioned. So because your program is, is running while you're editing it, you want things to change through time. And that we use this var uh, object. So if I, this is really useful for creating things like chord sequences, for example. So if I create a variable called chords, um, create a var object, which takes two arguments. The first is sort of a list of states it should hold. Here it's just uh, the number is 0, 1, 2, and 3. And the second argument is the um, duration it should hold that state for. So when the time you know, is 0 beats and I print that, it will give me a 0. After 8 beats, it will give me a 1. After 16 beats, it will show a 2. And after uh, 24 beats, it will be a 3. And once I get back around, so after 32 beats, it will go back around to the first element again and give me a 0. So I mentioned these players. I want them to have states I could access from other places. Um, and it can be referenced. So for example, on the bottom line, my piano player, P2, is using a follow method, and it takes a player uh, as an argument, B1, and it derives its pitch value from B1, which is the bass. So it's taking the pitch from the bass, and then you can see it's adding some values to it on the right, which forms a chord. Um, these can also be algorithmically altered in time. So again, I want things to change through time, so every four beats, I can call the reverse method on a player. Um, you name the method as a string, and it looks it up using the getAttra function. And I can also reference um, certain attributes um, of other players. So if I had this P1 pluck player going, I can then reference it in P2 by grabbing the P1.pitch and adding two steps to it, so it form a harmony. And these are dynamic and versatile, so if the, the uh, contents of P1 dot pitch changes, um, so does the p2 dot pitch, which is um, two steps higher. Um, and then all of these sort of events are handled by this clock object, which you can use to schedule any callable object, like a function. And this, this is what handles all the musical events. Um, 
and it can yeah, schedule functions in the future. Um, you can even write a function that then calls itself in the future while you're editing it, and that's called temporal recursion. It's kind of how the player objects work. So this is a sort of watered down version of the player call method where it will update its state, play the note, and then schedule itself in, well, based on its duration to then play another note. Okay, so I've got a bit of time to do a bit of a demonstration. You can have an idea of what it's like in action. So, okay, so here's a, a Fox dot editor. So I use that double arrow syntax and start playing a note by pressing control and enter.
Well, I want to clear up a couple of misconceptions. Uh, one is that um, live coders are not DJs. We're making live music uh, improvised usually. We're not trying to replace DJs either. We're not some kind of post-human AI thing that's trying to replace anyone. We're just making music. But we're not software engineers either. In engineering, I guess you have a problem and you go through some process to solve it, design process. Um, but live coders are much more interested in causing problems than solving them. There's no policy, a short process. And then at the end of the live coding performance, you tend to delete all your codes, so you don't even end up with anything, any product at the end, apart from the live experience. And it's not really a sci-fi thing either. It, it's more like stripping back technology, taking away user interfaces, and revealing the language that's underneath and um, so treating a laptop as a language machine to describe the music. So what we're doing when we're live coding is making patterns, really. We're treating code as a pattern language, and we're making it for the body. People are, are always literally stepping into the code by responding to music that's made. Pattern music can buy pattern music in code. It sort of fits into different categories. One is repetition, which is obviously very useful in rave music. Another is symmetry. Um, rotation, and um, also deviations, or play with people's expectations, the sweet anticipation of music, and then the breaking of that anticipation is a lot of what music is all about. It sort of comes around in the form of rather than
you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you want to find out more information about live coding, check out toplap.org or algorave.com to find out where your nearest algorave is. Um, Fox.org has some useful information about getting started, installing some tutorials, things like that. And we've got a bit of a Slack community. Well, it was on Slack, but we've moved to a, a new free um, software on talk.lurk.org. Um, and if you've got any other questions, I'm very happy to answer them now. So. Thank you. Thank you for the very intriguing talk. Um, unsurprisingly, there are a number of questions. Um, the currently top voted question is, will we be able to hear you tonight at the social event? Please, 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 yes. <laughs> Um, I don't know. There was nothing in, in currently agreed, but perhaps I could talk to someone and, and maybe sort something out. Um, but we'll, we'll see, maybe. <laughs> uh, do you play any other music instrument except for uh, your PC? If so, do you use your knowledge of music theory in live coding? Yeah, so I started learning um, piano and then guitar and things like that. Um, but it wasn't until university where I sort of came to like, contact with live coding when I did a, a master's in computer music. My undergrad was in computer science, but I played music in my spare time. Then I wanted to try and pursue the two of those together, and that's where I, I found live coding. And musical theory definitely helps, but I know some people who can't read a word, or read a word, read a note on um, a sheet music, but they are really excellent uh, performers of live electronic music using live coding. So you don't, it's not required, but it, it does help sometimes. Can you use all of Python? Is Foxdot flexible enough to generate music, for example, the backing drum beat, based on input from a REST API, uh, for example, such as a Twitter feed? Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, you can use Python in it. It's, it's, it's kind of like an interactive Python editor. Um, so potentially, yeah. I mean, all, all of the Python libraries that you have installed on your machine are accessible while you use Foxdot, so I don't see why not. Uh, let's see. Can you control visual effects with Fox Dot 2? Fox Dot's not great for visual effects, so it's something I'd like to, to add to it. But um, some environments that are good are things called Jibber, which is based in JavaScript, um, which you can use in, in the browser, um, or Fluxus or Live Code Lab. They're all kind of dedicated to making visuals. Um, I think it's definitely possible. Um, with Python, but it's not something I've got around to doing yet, but it's something I'd like to add, yeah. It seems like uh, there's a question, uh, will there be a live coding workshop or sprint tomorrow? Um, no, there won't be. Um, so I did a workshop with um, Foxstar at the PyCon UK, but at that point, uh, it wasn't really very easy to install with Linux. Um, it's since come on a little bit, but I think only about five out of the 20 people who turned up were actually able to get it installed. So I thought for this time, until I make sure it, it can install on Linux and Mac better, um, it really depends on, on type of Python, things like that. Um, I didn't want to do a workshop because I don't want people to go away disappointed, basically. <laughs> Next question, full disclosure, it's my question. Um, are you coding entirely from memory or do you refer to any notes while coding? Um, I try to go from memory. Um, if I've got a gig, that's like quite long, I'll make some notes, or if I have something that I've liked when I've been rehearsing, I'll make notes and, and bring it along. But I think some of the best music I, I make is when I've run out of notes and I've still got some five minutes to fill and I'll create something new in the spot. And that's kind of what live coding is, is about, is just exploring um, music and you can come up with some really interesting ideas. Uh, let's see. Um, I th uh, one question, have you considered autofill? Not oh, yeah, for the editor. Um, yeah, I'd like to. Um, so you can use Fox Dot with um, Atom as an editor. Someone has, so from, so the nice thing about being an open source project is people contribute in all sorts of ways, and people have added an interpreter for Atom. Um, I just, I guess, because I, I wrote Fox Dot to start with just because it would send messages from the tkinter within Python, but now you can pipe it in from other sources. And autofill is something that's been on my to-do list since almost day one, which was three years ago. <laughs> so maybe one day I will add it, because it would make a lot of, a lot of people's lives easier. Yeah. Um, is it possible to do collaborative live coding? Yeah, so actually what my research has entailed is, um, is writing a, creating an editor to 
do simultaneous collaborative, so people work in the same document. Um, so I'm exploring all different sorts of ways people can collaborate. You can do clock synchronization um, across multiple computers if you want to do it separately. Uh, that's probably another, another good way. Um, part of my research university is about how to collaborate with live coding. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks very much for your talk. It was really interesting. Thank you so much. Cheers.